From time to time in our prayer, it can help us to think about or to imagine what's happening in Rome right now, what's happened, what happened on this date or around this time in the history of Opus Dei, in the history of the life of our Father, in the history of the soul of our Father. In Rome today, we're in the, it's the beginning of the year almost. The school year starts next week, probably on Tuesday or Wednesday next week for all the Roman universities. So today's kind of like the end of the summer. The summer more or less goes from June 29th to September 29th. And of course, in Villa Tevre, the work continues as always, the work of governing the work. At Cavabianca, all the new people are arriving. There's lots of trips to the airport. And <clears throat> as people arrive, of course, this is one of the great, this is one of the days where they can, the father will probably have a get together with the people today at Cava Bianca. And it's a great day in the sense that we recall today the angels, right? And, and the angels that, it's also interesting, if you know the history of the work, that it was right around, it was in September of 1932. So we're, this year will be the 85th anniversary. It was in September of 1932 that our father began to have the sense that I need to make a retreat. And he was very concerned about, he couldn't call them the St. Raphael boys yet. <laughs> Because there wasn't this, there wasn't the, we, we didn't have the three archangels as our intercessors quite yet. But our father was very concerned that August and September about St. Raphael boys who had been thrown into prison. Imagine that local council meeting. <clears throat> Are these guys really select? <laughs> They're in jail. <laughs> I think we got to re reshuffle our list. Get new starters for the league. Look into our bench here. <laughs> our top guys are in jail. They're criminals. This is who our father was dealing with. They were in jail for political reasons, but they were in jail. <laughs> it's not an easy thing to be in jail. I think we all understand that. I mean, it's, it's, from a, even from a social standpoint, it's humiliating. Even if, even if it's false, even if they're false charges. <coughs> and our father felt the need in, in the context of trying to deal with these souls Our father, when he went and visited them, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point here of the meditation, our father really felt the need on the one hand of making sure they were struggling in something while in jail. So he would go visit them in jail. <clears throat> and sometimes he, because they were political prisoners, he couldn't see them. But he would leave them something that would try, where he would try to help them in their struggle. A book. One particular fellow, he left him a book. On the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, on a particular devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's it, I think it's called the little devotion, the little devotional to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Something to keep them struggling in jail. And this was, this was not, <clears throat> this was not unique to their being in jail as far as our father was concerned. And eventually in the work, this developed into the idea of the particular exam, which we call now the particular exam. 
And so, Lord, we ask you today in our prayer that while we're here, in these two years that we're here, there's so much we need to ask for while we're here. There's so much, there's so many steps that we can take to mature as children of God in Opus Dei. But that we can come to see the importance of the particular exam. And that we can become masters, not only of the particular exam, but really being able to teach others how to discover and how to live a particular exam on the path to sanctity as an important part of the path to sanctity. We know that in the, in the next, we might even pray about this in the upcoming week or so, but in the next week or so, our father, he would make a retreat in 1932. This retreat that he was longing for. <clears throat> and that on that retreat, he would, he would see very clearly the three archangels. For the St. Michael, St. Gabriel, St. Raphael for the apostolate that Opus Dei would carry out with the various groups of people. And we know from looking at scripture, it's actually interesting just to do a simple search of scripture. Sometimes, sometimes people will ask the question, do angels appear in scripture? They're all over the place, <laughs> right? Our Lord himself in the New Testament is constantly referring to the angels. And the angels, <clears throat> the angels, for example, our, our Lord says, the angels guard and protect the little ones. They're at our, the angels are at our service. Those who live celibacy, our Lord says, in a way are equal to the angels. The angels are at our service. And this is the whole notion of service in the church. And it's the whole notion of service in Opus Dei. It's the real notion of service and authority. It's not the American notion that all authority is evil and we need to flee from authority, right? Run away from the director's table. <clears throat> the, the notion that the highest angels, the most powerful angels are at the service of those who are below them. And in fact, theologians speculate this is one of the reasons for the rebellion of the evil one and whoever followed him at the beginning of creation because, they, because they, they're outside of time. So, in a, so in, a, in a mysterious way, which we can't fully comprehend, they, they see all of time. They see at some point that they will be at the service of beings that are lower than them, that their whole, the whole purpose of their existence will be to serve <clears throat> humans, creatures that are not purely spiritual, but that are spiritual and material at the same time. And they understand the hierarchy of being, that they are higher in the hierarchy of being, than these creatures which they're destined to serve. And so they, they bolt. They say, this isn't right. I will not serve. Whereas Michael, and we can assume Gabriel and Raphael as well, they say, I will serve. And one of the images of Michael, of course, is Michael has a sword. <clears throat> and our father liked to think of this image of the sword, the sword of attack in the spiritual life. And St. Michael in particular, for numeraries, St. Michael is our patron for the formation of our, of our fellow brothers who are numeraries in the work. 
And so we can go in a particular way to say, Michael, thinking of this attack, this mode of attack, right? We, can, we all know it in sports, we all know in, in the military, we understand this imagery of attacking. You can, there, are, there are moments when you can defend and there are moments when you attack, where you overtake your enemy. <clears throat> and in the spiritual life, there's a similar analogy. And the particular exam, we, we, when we think of the particular exam, we don't mean it. Of course, we all, we all know that the, the using the notion of the sword or the attack or whatnot, it's in a purely spiritual sense. <clears throat> you couldn't apply it to just war theory because if you did, there would be no unjust war. <laughs> but attack in the sense of rooting out vices, acquiring virtues, And perhaps, Lord, we want to ask you a question. There are many great, great qualities and dispositions and even maybe proper sentiments that we need to foster in our spiritual life. And it's good that we understand these qualities and dispositions <clears throat> and maybe even sentiments that we should acquire. <coughs> but perhaps, Lord, we run the risk of getting, of emotionalizing or, or sentimentalizing the spiritual struggle. I feel this way. I feel that way. My emotions were this. My emotions were that. I was hurt by this. I was hurt by that. And we could spend all of our time trying to get all of our emotions to be exactly the way they should be. Theoretically, they should be. Because that's what some psychiatrist or psychologist has thought. You know, we need these perfect emotions. And in fact, we need these perfect emotions and you need six pills <clears throat> to moderate all of your emotions and sentiments so that you are the perfectly tranquilized or tranquil, what is it? person who then gets dementia when he's 80 years old and can't think anymore and his tongue is hanging out and you think you're Napoleon and you can't, you can't tie a tie anymore so you just go around in a t-shirt <clears throat> and because sometimes maybe Lord sometimes and we're sorry if this happens to us we're sorry if we turn the spiritual life into a struggle of trying to acquire the perfect set of emotions. And we can become obsessed with trying to balance all of our emotions, become perfectly the perfect stoic who has all the right emotional responses to the events of life. And the danger here is we never acquire a virtue. Lord, we ask you for this grace that we can really struggle to identify virtues and to concretize our struggle in acquiring them. Why? Because we want to love you more. We want to enlarge our souls. We want you to enlarge our souls. We don't want you to enlarge our range of emotions and how to balance them. Unless, of course, that's just a consequence of acquiring virtues. And we want to acquire virtues, Lord, so that we can do more in your service.
Our Lord in one of the parables of the kingdom of heaven the parable of the vineyard the laborers in the vineyard our Lord when he hires the laborers and we, we're not, we don't need to necessarily do it, a, a complete analysis of the, virtu- of, the, of the parable today but when our Lord hires the laborers our Lord sends them into the vineyard to cultivate it to work it And to cultivate a vine, there's many potential different things that need to be done to cultivate a vine. The soil might need to be dug around it. There could be certain fertilizers, natural or organic fertilizers, of course, that need to be placed in the soil. There could be, there may or may not be water that's needed depending on the season. Certain branches might need to be cut so the vine doesn't decay and die. I mean, cultivation requires analysis and work and thought and study and a certain skill that is acquired over time. And, of course, this is this is what spiritual direction is for. This is what the chat is for. To help us to assess the conditions that we're in. And Lord, we ask you for this grace too, that we can go to the chat. We can go with the real sense of, well, this is my struggle. This is what's happened. In, in this particular thing, And our father saw an example that he liked to refer to and that becomes part of the way of a a particular exam. And I think to go through it almost slowly, Lord, here in our prayer, it might help us. Our father in the way speaks of the heroically ordinary life of that man of God. We saw him fight whole months and years. What accounts he kept in his particular exam at breakfast. Today he won, tomorrow he was beaten. Now the English translation will explain, but the English translation is not so, I mean, it's understandable. He noted, I didn't take sugar, I did take sugar. May you and I live our sugar tragedy. That's the English translation. And it's actually, a, it's, not, it's not correct. It's not exact. The actual tragedy is called the butter tragedy. <laughs> because the fellow was a, he was a priest. Father William Doyle. And we know this now from our father's notebooks. And Father William Doyle was a chaplain He was from Ireland. He was a chaplain in the the First World War. And he was a very holy man, apparently. He was holy enough to where by the 1920s, by the 1930s, sorry, he he was dead. And they had written a biography of, of his life. And they had started his cause of canonization. And this particular man, who was Irish, and I suppose for the Irish at breakfast time, the best breakfast in the world would be a scone with butter, with lots of butter, lots of Irish butter. And so at bre- so this fellow, Father Doyle, he wanted to gain dominion over his appetite to acquire real temperance. So he made the resolution to not have butter at breakfast, not put butter on his scones or his bread or his pastries or whatever. And it's interesting to see what our father 
found so edifying about this fellow. And it's also interesting to see how he lived and how he sometimes failed in his particular exam. So on one particular day, for example, Father Doyle noted a strong temptation and we, you can read this, it's in the commentary on the way. It's not, I'm not, I mean, I didn't do a lot of research to find this. We're not, I didn't have to go to the New York Public Library. A strong temptation during Mass and the act of thanksgiving. So this is what he was doing. This is what he was doing during the Mass and his thanksgiving after Mass. To scuttle my resolution and give joy to my appetite at breakfast <laughs> the idea of a breakfast with dry bread in the future, it's almost like he's saying, you know, how could I go my whole life eating dry bread for breakfast? Seemed quite intolerable to me. And then later on, <clears throat> He says, God has been urging me on strongly during these exercises to give up butter completely. I have done so at many meals without difficulty, but I have turned back out of human respect and through a fear of the others noticing it. Lord, this means that this fellow from time to time was living the resolution but then he gave up because he thought, well, people are going to notice. He started to get interiorly complicated. My, my, the people that eat with me, they're going to notice that now I'm not eating butter, and they're going to say something, or they're going to ask me a question, and they're going to do this, and they're going to do that, and I don't want to have to worry about all that, so I'm just going to eat butter. Forget about my resolution. Which makes us think also of this other passage in the way, this other point in the way. <clears throat> Where our father says, look, if they've seen you, if they've seen you fail, or if they've seen your lack of virtue, why, do, why does it matter if they see you now try to live virtue? Just do it. And then Doyle says, he, he corrects himself, even if they were to notice it. What, why would this be important? Because the one thing I'm certain of is that Jesus is constantly asking me and that I don't have the courage to give it up, to give up butter completely. And then he makes a compromise. He says, I know what I'll do. I'll use butter with two slices of bread at breakfast, but not at the other meals. <laughs> Lord, we do the same. We know we do the same. Well, Lord, give us the grace to at least do as much to keep, an to keep an account, to keep an account of our failures. Our Father speaks of the examination of conscience as bookkeeping. Examination of conscience, a daily task. Bookkeeping, never neglected by anyone in the business. And is there any business more worthy than the business of eternal life? And even this point from the way <clears throat> our father is just drawing from a very old tradition of the church that goes back to St. John Chrysostom. St. John Chrysostom who says, our struggle in our struggles, we should give an account the same way that business people give an account. Business people, they do their accounts to learn what profits they made today, what profits they made yesterday, what they hope to do tomorrow. They make plans how to make money. And what's our money? What's our lucre? As we were saying before, our lucre, our dirty money is the spiritual life. We're children of God. That's the most important business we have. It's the most valuable thing that we own. It's more important than anything we could imagine.
And our Lord wants us to be wiser than the, than the children of this world, who oftentimes, in the way they keep their accounts, appear to be wiser than the children of light. St. Augustine says, a daily task, each day, we have to take, we have to make an examination of our struggle. Lord, we ask you for this grace, this grace of a true, of really carrying our sword and attacking with our sword. And on this day, we go especially to the archangels so that we can not only have the sword ourselves, but so that we can teach the St. Raphael boys, the young professionals, whatever they are, that we can teach them that we, to imitate you, to imitate the saints in this heroic struggle to acquire virtues so that we can mature, we can all mature as children of God. Mary, intercede, Queen of Apostles, intercede for us.